Hello, this is the second of five uh, link podcasts that looks at the early years of the Nazi party. Uh, there's the mind map that you're looking at there that we used in Friday's revision session. Um, we're focusing in on um, the this particular strand today. Um, so again, you would have been filling that in in Friday's session, but um, if, if you didn't complete it, you can add further detail from this podcast, and I would strongly recommend that you use make it as visual as possible, as, as I've shown here with the first strand, putting little pictures in if you've got an artistic inclination is a good idea, um, uh, but it could be um, colour highlighting and so on. Okay, so <coughs> as you can see, uh, we'll quickly go through who Adolf Hitler was, his early life, him joining the party, and the growth of the Nazi party in the early years. Okay, so... Um, we have a picture of Adolf Hitler there, born in Austria in the year 1889. Um, he was born on a, a border region. Um, um, Austria uh, is, was a country uh, to the east of Germany, um, the southeast of Germany. Uh, it was a largely German-speaking country. Um, many Austrians believed that Austria and Germany should be united into a larger Germany. Um, that they naturally ident identified um, with Germany. Um, Hitler, because he lived close to the border, um, was very much one of those types of Austrian. He always saw himself as German. Um, in fact, his, one of his biggest influences as a young man um, was, his, um, was, was his history teacher at school, um, who was a German and nationalist. Remember that phrase, nationalist, that we picked up in the previous podcast. Okay, it's a patriot, patriotic idea of identifying with 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 um, your country. Um, so, uh, Hitler left school um, at the age of fifteen. Um, he, he he was not a, a a strong academic student. He didn't do very well at school. Um, the year he left school, his mother, um, his his mother Clara died, and um, it was it was a, a shock to this young man. I suppose we have to ask ourselves at what point in his mind he became very much unhinged, um, and it probably around about this time um, he went to the capital city of Austria, which is called Vienna, where he wanted to become an artist, um, but was rejected by the um, the art academy um, in. Uh, Vienna, and and again, probably at the same time as as, as the death of his mother, um, it, it had a huge effect on his mind. He became a very bitter, angry young man. Um, lived as a down and out in Vienna, never as bad as he 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 claimed he, he his life later was. I mean, later on, when he wrote Mein Kampf, which is his, his autobiography, so to speak, he always claimed that he. Um, was really hard up. He actually had had a reasonable income from a wealthy aunt, if I remember correctly. Anyway, um, uh, during the uh, the six years that he was in Vienna, um, so he was in Vienna um, from 1907 through to 1913. Um, that's when he became interested in politics, um, and by 1914. Um, he was a passionate um, German nationalist. And so when World War I broke out in August 1914, he crossed the border from Austria into Germany um, and uh, went to the nearest city, which was Munich, in the state of Bavaria. Remember, we looked at that um, in the previous session, um, in the south of Germany. And where, where he joined up, he, 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 he volunteered and he joined the German army. And for four years, he was actually a very, very successful soldier. He fought in Belgium, in the, in the north, not too far from, um, from, from England. Um, and on two occasions, he won medals for bravery. Um, uh, much of the time in the trenches, he, was, he, he, was, uh, he, he, he ran the communication trenches. It was his job to send messages from one trench to the next. Um, and a very, very dangerous um, uh, role that um, the average lifespan of um, somebody, a, sol a soldier who did that, was very, very brief, something like two or three weeks. But he, he, he survived the whole of the war, and he was decorated twice for bravery. Um, he later 
Um, well, we have to ask ourselves where his ideas came from. But it's worth remembering that for the first time in his life, he was being successful. Um, he found a place. So probably two of his core ideas, um, his beliefs, came out of his war experience. Firstly, his 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 um, his his extreme nationalism. Remember, if you're nationalistic, um, there's a range of beliefs. You you, know, you believe you should support your country, and there's nothing wrong with that. But extreme nationalism, he actually believed that war was good. That when countries went to war, it brought out the best in men, the best qualities. Um, so that was probably an idea he took from the trenches. Um, and secondly, his belief in, a, in, in, in leadership from above. Um, because, of course, the army, there's no discussion, there's no debate, there's no democracy. Soldiers don't vote about orders. They simply do as they're told. The orders come down the food chain from the leader. Uh, and Hitler very much believed that, that was the best way. He found a place. He liked a, a unit, a, an organisation, where there was very, very clear definition about uh, about roles and commands were given from above. So he left um, well, in in the, on the 11th of November 1918 when the war ended. Hitler was actually in hospital. He'd been temporarily blinded by a gas attack. Um, and as with many, many German soldiers who believed that the war was being won, and I won't go into the background of, as to why they lost, but remember the essence of it is, is that um, it was that Germany, German soldiers were still on foreign soil. They hadn't retreated back to their own soil, and so they felt betrayed by the politicians at home, the, um, the new politicians, they there. Um, and the, the Republicans who basically had uh, signed the surrender um, and declared Germany to be a republic, they saw that as a betrayal and also very much felt betrayed by the Spartacists, by the left-wing groups who were telling the workers to refuse to cooperate with the war, to put down their, um, their, their, their tools in the factories and so on. Um, so when he, w um, when he was told in hospital that the war had been won, as with many soldiers of his type, he basically um, refused to settle down into normal peacetime life. Okay, at first he, he just gravitated, he left the hospital and he gravitated back to where he'd come, where he joined up, went down to Bavaria, went to Munich, um, and so he was a, he was. W w and refused, well, basically didn't give over his weapons. He wanted to carry on being a soldier as best he could, even though the war had come to an end. So he was one of the Fry Corps um, who were allowed to continue to exist um, in the early months to crush communism. Remember, they played an important role in crushing the Spartacist uprising. Um, so he, in Bavaria, he basically um, was given a job working for the army as a kind of... Um, as a kind of spy, I suppose, his job was to look out for communists. So, um, summer 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. It did everything in Hitler's mind to confirm the fact that uh, the new German government in Berlin was, was, was uh, the enemy of, of, of all good Germans, etc. Um, and then in September 1919, he was told to go to a beer hall in Munich to, where, where there was a suspected left-wing group suspected um, communist group meeting. So Hitler sided up to them, um, listening to their conversation. You can see why they thought they were a left-wing group, because they had the word workers in the party, but actually um, they were a very, very right-wing group. Okay, They were, and they got the word German at the beginning, led by Anton Drexler, you can see him here, who was the founder of the party, um, called the German Workers' Party. And so Hitler um, got involved in the conversation basically and he was invited to join the party and he joined as member number seven and he was given the job to win recruits for the party. Okay, So that it was an extremely right-wing party, a nationalist party. Um, Hitler discovered a, a unique talent and that was the talent of public speaking. So he, t he helped um, the, the party expand and... Um, uh, so, for example, he, he, he got involved with, a new, uh, with, with um, setting up a newspaper called the Volkische Beobachter, the uh, People's Observer. Um, on the 24th of February 1920, you've got the information there, 2,000 people came to a big meeting. So the party really expanded because of Hitler. Um, and on that date, that to, to, to strengthen the name of the party, to emphasise, remember it was originally called the German Workers' Party, so they put the word national at the beginning, 
And although they were not a workers' party at all, but they wanted to win the workers away from left-wing ideas, so they'd always had the word workers in, but they put the word socialist in at the beginning as well, and so it became the National Socialist German Workers' Party, um, the Nazi party for short. Um, so that, that was the, the, the official birth of the Nazi party, 24th of February 1920. And it published a 25-point programme of its aims. And you, you can see there, okay, that's the original 25-point programme of its So, um, a quick factual test. Um, I, I won't read those questions to you. You've just got to press pause on the podcast, okay? So, um, you, you can um, uh, obviously get a bit of paper, write them down, um, and then when you've finished it, um, take it off pause and go to the next slide, which has got the answers. So there are the answers to those questions. Okay, that's the end of this podcast. Um, go on to the um, on to podcast uh, three, uh, which follows next, which is um, how Hitler took control of the party. Thank you.